Hello and uh, welcome to the Consulting Lifestyle Podcast to uh, Rayford Palmer. How are you, Rayford? I am great. Thank you, Dio. Nice to see you online today in this podcast. Thank you for having me. Yes, and you are a very special guest because I think you're the first lawyer, but for sure, you're the first divorce lawyer. That's not a typical subject that we uh, approach on the podcast, but it is part of life. So podcast is named Consulting Lifestyle. And I don't know if I can say it, unfortunately or fortunately, divorce is part of life. So uh, uh, I think it's important to approach this subject. So can right. you uh, introduce yourself to the audience? I mean, sharing uh, the most important part of your uh, career story. Sure. My name is Rayford Palmer. I'm the uh, managing shareholder of STG Divorce Law, a divorce law firm in the Chicagoland area in Illinois. I've been practicing law for over 25 years. I've been a divorce lawyer for over 20 years, and I decided to write a book to help out clients such as the listeners to your podcast, business owners, professionals, consultants who are looking for strategic advice about divorce. And this book is good for anyone who is considering divorce, contemplating it, involved in it, or who's actually gone through it and are dealing with issues after the divorce. So the book's called I Just Want This Done. And it's a it's on all major platforms, Kindle, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. But it's to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a divorced father of two sons. I have two stepdaughters. I'm remarried. And I understand the consulting lifestyle because I, I live the consulting lifestyle myself. We are consultants to our clients. And we represent a large number of high net worth, high income business owners and professionals, some of whom travel a lot for their for their work. We have to give people advice about some of the most sensitive issues of their lives, their assets, their children, their family life, what to do with all these things in the event of a divorce. And so it's a very privileged position that we hold with our clients. And we take our role as consultants and counselors very seriously. So mm -hmm. the book grew out of my desire to provide that kind of advice in a prepackaged way to a large number of people not just limited to my clients. And I thought there was a need for strategic advice out in the world, that things that you can't find on Google. And that's yep. the purpose behind the book. Our mission is to reduce the stress and anxiety for people yep. and make sure that they are able to preserve their assets, their children and their sanity in divorce. Yes. So you're so right. Assets, children, and uh, sanity. So typically uh, what happens when a couple or one married person uh, decides to divorce? Then this is common throughout the United States and also Canada. So mm -hmm. typically that person would then seek out an attorney, get advice about the divorce, and then they can proceed a number of ways. They can proceed with court action, you know, get divorced by a judge, or they can agree to work out a settlement with their spouse, which we advocate whenever possible. So if we can resolve your divorce in a business-like fashion by negotiation rather than litigation, or by com rather than by combat, by negotiation is the best way. I think, yes, of course, better to be able to negotiate and discuss. And what have you seen, if there is a typical scenario, but what have you seen happen for professionals that are working? So they travel to go to work and they, they say, okay, but I would like to keep custody of my children or have custody of my children. Is it typically more difficult for those professionals? or? So courts generally, and, and I can speak to Illinois because that's my direct experience, but this is generally true, certainly in the United States. I suspect also during Canada, but courts generally like to follow a status quo with respect to parenting schedules. So if however you've been living with your children before the divorce is likely to be a pattern the court finds appropriate after the divorce. However, that can change if people's behavior is inappropriate towards the children or neglectful, like during the divorce case. If somebody's not paying much attention to the children, it's going to be difficult for them to make a case that they should be spending a lot of time with the children. Mm -hmm. However, there is a public policy that the courts would like to see both parents spending time with their children. So usually courts would prefer to see both parents involved in the children's lives substantially. We've seen a trend toward, let's say, the, the person with less parenting involvement. We could say traditionally fathers, but that's no, mm -hmm. no longer the case with, you know, there are more women in the workplace and same sex couples and that. So those, those norms are, or those old standards, I guess, are quite different now. So, but the truth is usually one parent has more parenting responsibilities than the other. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is a trend towards that parent that had less amount of time getting more involvement than before. There's a movement afoot in the United States 
to make that the law, that the default should be equal parenting time between parents. That's now the law in several states. It's not in our state, at least at this time, but there's a movement to make that the default unless somebody proves it should be otherwise. In our state, the standard is best interest of the child should determine the parenting schedule. Okay, that's very interesting, that principle of equal parenting. So that would mean adaptation for both parents <laughs> if they were not already right. equally uh, parenting the child. Some yeah. advice I guess I would have for a traveling parent, if you've got yeah. a consultant who's traveling frequently, make the best of the time that you have with the children when you are home, spend frequent amounts of time with them on vacation, take them out to dinner, do things with them, at, go to the zoo, do a lot of activities with them when you are home. But then also be involved even remotely, do a lot of FaceTime, talk to the kids, play video games with them, you know, cooperatively online. And also keep, if you think a divorce is coming, keep records of those interactions so you have evidence to show that you are very involved with the children, even if you are working away from home frequently. Yeah, that's a great point because now with COVID, more, way more people are working from home. So maybe that difference, making the difference between the workplace and where you live, it's the difference is blur. So we could think, oh, okay, I am with the kids, but you, you actually have a, a laptop on your lap and you are answering to emails or, or to calls, etc. while the kid is playing uh, next to you. So yeah, I think that's important. Presence is important in any case, but even more than in the, in the right. divorce uh, case. Courts understand that there's a trend toward remote work and that there's a trend towards, you know, parents juggling childcare with their work duties. And that's understandable. And courts don't generally, certainly in our area, penalize people for that. However, if you're pitched to a court, if you are in litigation, if you're unfortunately in litigation and you're trying to sell the court that you should have more parenting time, it would not be good to say, well, the child will be with a babysitter or child care provider while I'm working versus the, if the other parent is fully available perhaps they're not working or whatever, the court's going to generally prefer somebody who's truly available to the children versus somebody who's just proposing to give childcare or they're working full-time during the time they propose to have parenting time. These are, I call them squishy issues. They're hard to get your hands around mm -hmm. and they're not absolute certainties in every case and everyone's facts differ. So it's important to get the advice of a qualified attorney wherever Whatever you, wherever you live, it's important to get the advice of a qualified lawyer in your area because jurisdictions differ. The law differs, obviously, between the U.S. and Canada, and decision-making might even differ between judge to judge in the same jurisdiction. Wow. Right. So, yeah, so, so it's very important. And for a typical, like a consulting, maybe a solopreneur or a person that owns or co-owns a, a consulting firm, so they typically do a long hours. Sure. Uh, so have you often seen those type of professionals decide to uh, change a bit their uh, professional schedule, try to be uh, more home, more present, more, uh, more available uh, even during the, the week? Yes, I think the, the more the people that do better with parenting time tend to change their schedule such that they're available to their clients, but they're also available to their children. So they might get mm -hmm. up early in the morning, do some work online, do some of their work, take the kids to school, you know, get involved with the children, wake them up, get them to school, get back to work for a period of time be, and be available after school. And then perhaps they're working again later at night, juggling their schedules so they have time with their children. And usually with parenting schedules, the other parent's going to have the children for, let's say, half of the time. So there will be weekends or there will be weekdays where the kids aren't with you at all. And there's usually plenty of time to get your work done. It's just that you're going to have to be a little bit more flexible about when you get things done, but it's certainly doable. And my job's similar. I mean, we, in our job, it's, it can be an always on type of position because people want answers on weekends and at night. So, you know, we've had to juggle our schedules too, certainly in the pandemic and also with our children when they were younger, when I was married to my ex-wife, we were both professionals, both busy, and we had to juggle the children and work as well. And it, it all worked out. It's doable. You just have to sometimes be a little bit creative and willing to be flexible, but it can be done, especially with, you know, work from home solopreneur where you're your own boss you're your own boss. Your boss isn't going, to get, isn't going to be upset that you're not somewhere nine to five. So there's actually a big advantage in a lot of ways to being your own boss or being in a consulting business where you can have more control of your schedule. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, if we go back to the title of the book, I just want this done. So where does the title come from? I have an idea, but I want to let you so the Explain. title comes from a familiar phrase that the clients would say to us after, you know, several months go by in a divorce, they would say, 
I just want this done. You know, mm -hmm. it's a statement of sometimes resignation, like I'm, I'm finished with this, I want this done, but a statement of determination and intent to get it done intentionally and with forethought and to be over with it, that there's a value in just being divorced where uh, these cases don't age well. Nobody enjoys being in the middle of a divorce case and they're spending money, time and mental energy and emotional energy for their families as well is being spent while these cases are ongoing. So the value of being done is substantial. And so that's where the title came from, really just the definitive statement, I just want this done, get me out of here, is kind of the statement that a client makes at some point in the case. Almost everybody says it eventually. That's where that came from. For how long in the worst cases uh, a divorce can last and in the best cases uh, as well? Uh, what have you so seen? The, the typical case in, in our area, a typical case can take anywhere from nine months to a year or more in the suburban Chicago area, but in the city itself, a case can take one to three years or more. So it can be a very long time if people fight it out. If people are willing to agree, cases can be resolved much more quickly. Anywhere from six to nine months for a typical divorce if people are willing to negotiate, sometimes much sooner if people can get along. So, mm -hmm. so much depends on the personalities of the people involved and also the mindset of the attorneys involved. Okay. Now, uh, on the subject of uh, protecting or managing assets during a marriage and divorce, I assume that the, the laws are different according to the country, to the province, to the state, etc. But what type of protection mechanism could be put in place? Oh, of course, I know that you know Illinois, so it's, we are not saying that's what right. you have to do. But typically, uh, what are the type of protection mechanisms that you have seen? Uh... So the things that work, certainly in the United States, are prenuptial agreements. So before one gets married, if you have a business interest, if you have assets, it, I would urge anyone watching this to get a premarital or prenuptial agreement because that will protect your non-marital assets in the event of a divorce. Your business interests, real estate, whatever you own, will be walled off and protected from divorce if the premarital agreement is done correctly. And there are steps to follow to make sure it's done properly, including full disclosure of assets and liabilities, income and expenses to the other person, doing it soon enough that it's not too close to the marriage so the person can't claim that they're under undue duress. And then also that I prefer to have what we kind of call a closing ceremony or signing ceremony where both parties are present the best is to have video and have a court reporter and you ask them questions like, are you under duress? Do you understand the terms of the agreement? You know, do you think the terms are fair? And you get people to agree to those things and you keep that document and the video. So if later they claim they were under undue pressure, they didn't understand it, et cetera, you now have not only the premarital agreement, but you have the video evidence and the typed out record under oath to show that they weren't under duress. They said at the time they were fine and everything was okay. That's very powerful evidence to go against a challenge against a premarital agreement. Premarital agreements or prenups are very strong and upheld in all 50 states. There Sometimes there are successful challenges against them, but those are rare. So number one is a prenup. Mm -hmm. Number two is putting, it's best to put all those assets in a trust before you get married to make a very clear delineation between what is non-marital and what is marital. So it's, it's an estate planning tool, but it's also a trust is also an asset protection tool. So I'm not a financial planner and I'm, I'm not a tax person, I'm not a CPA, but I'm confident in saying a trust combined with the premarital agreement is about the best protection you can hope for if you're a person owning business interests about to get married. Excellent. Uh, very good. And to come back on the pre-marital uh, agreements, do you see uh, people that are comfortable with having that discussion? Because it's kind of uh, saying, okay, babe, I want to get married, but I also want to protect <laughs> it. In case it comes. So uh, or do you see most people uh, being comfortable having that discussion and really do it? Or they say they want to avoid talking about it or they say, no, 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 I'm sure we will never uh, separate uh, in the future. So yeah, it, admittedly, it's a difficult discussion to have. Which is why we would advise, you know, I would advise anybody to have the discussion as soon as possible. Don't wait till you get wedding venue reserved and money committed to the marriage. Have the discussion early around the time of the engagement because you're going to, it's going to bring up important discussions about money and your future and things you should probably be talking, talking about anyway. So it's not just protecting yourself, it also will help both people in the event of a divorce, simplifying the divorce and making the terms having the terms set forth in the premarital agreement will make the divorce 
less complex, typically less expensive and take less time because much more is determined by the premarital agreement. So you can talk to your spouse or future spouse that way by saying, this is really good for both of us. We need to have these discussions ahead of time anyway. We really should be talking about money and what we think about your property and my property and our incomes and what happens if we buy a house or, or if somebody already owns real estate. What are we doing with that? What are people's expectations? It's good to get those discussions out early anyway. And if you find out you're incompatible several months before the marriage, well, that's a good thing. Then maybe that's not the person to marry. If your assets are valuable to you and you believe you should keep them, and that person thinks that you should share them with them, shouldn't you know that several months before you get For married? Sure. I mean, that's, to me, the, it's not fun, but I'd certainly rather know that you've run into an insurmountable obstacle before you get married than to find out later that somebody had this expectation or two weeks before the wedding when you've already spent $25,000 on a venue and you've got everybody's already flying in for the wedding. <laughs> Do you want to call it off then? And that's the problem is everybody's under so much pressure close to the wedding. We have people come to us a week before the wedding, three weeks before the wedding, and it, it still can be legal, but boy, it's not advisable. Now you've added all the pressure of that yeah. and the family pressure on top of a difficult discussion already. Yes, yes, yeah. They would definitely have to make the video as you uh, as you advise. What about post? Because I heard post nuptial agreement as well, post marital agreement. Yes. Do they have the same weight or? So there are actually a couple things to talk about. If you're already married and it's too late to do a prenuptial agreement, there are two things to consider. One is what people have kind of called the poor man's prenup or just keeping things separate. So if you have assets from before the marriage, certainly in the United States, if you keep those assets segregated in your own accounts and don't mix them with marital accounts and don't add your spouse's name to the title of these accounts or your business, a court will hold that those are non-marital assets. So for example, if you own a business before the marriage, you don't need a prenup necessarily, premarital agreement to say that that asset remains non-marital. Now there's issues with income thrown off of it as to whether that's marital, but at least the business interest itself will be deemed to be non-marital property. It's still best to have the premarital agreement because there are a lot of other things you're dealing with in the premarital agreement beyond just that business interest, such as what are you doing about alimony? How are you paying for attorney's fees? What are you doing about health insurance and other terms that are important? But if you don't have a prenup, keeping things separated and not mixing marital assets with non-marital assets will be a good way to keep those things segregated. Okay. That's okay. one. Yep. And then the second thing you asked about is what happens if you're already married? Is there another agreement you can enter into? The answer is yes. It's called a post-marital agreement. It works similar to a premarital agreement with one major difference. The major difference is you must have good consideration for the premarital agreement. And that means some real value given to the other person to cause them to sign. So with the premarital agreement, the marriage itself is consideration. You know, I'll only marry you if you sign this is essentially mm -hmm. what you're saying. And the courts find that to be binding. The postnuptial agreement, you're creating some rights and you're binding both people and you have to give something for that. And that is proportionate to what you're doing in the postmarital agreement. For example, if you have a case where I'll just make up a number, let's say there's a $10 million business, $10 million mm -hmm. asset. And you're going to ask somebody to waive some rights in an asset. There better be valid consideration and not just $10,000 for somebody to give up an, a potential interest in a $10 million business. Maybe it's $2 million, maybe it's $3 million, maybe it's something paid over time, but there needs to be good valid consideration and something given in the present to cause somebody to sign that document in a court to say that was a fair deal, that yeah. what they gave up what it was a bargain for fair exchange. So post-nup really hinges on also on disclosure, the things like the prenup disclosure, yeah. no duress, but consideration, something that's legitimate value for entering into the agreement. What you usually see with a post-nup is terms to govern how the assets will be divided now. So a lot of parties will divide their marital assets immediately, but stay married, or at least divide them in some fashion or some portion. Mm -hmm. So let's say they have $5 million in total assets. They might divide two and a half million of that to give to them equally, and they each deal with it as they will, and that's their own money. The other two and a half million, maybe that's a house and some other cash, stays marital, and then they work out how they'll operate as married people, who pays for what, et cetera, in the post -nup. 
how is a marital asset created going forward? Do we both have to have our name on title, for example? Do we, you know, does it have to be, both of us have to be on the deed or is there some other mechanism? How do we deal with marital debts? Those things are dealt with in the postnup. Part two of the postnup is what happens when we get divorced? So mm-hmm. part one, how do we deal with things now? Part two, what happens if we get divorced? So with a prenup, you just have part two. Part one is in the postnup, what do we do now? Part two, what happens when we get divorced? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very well summarized and illustrated. Really thanks you, Rafe. I have a question, maybe a solo, because talking about the value of assets. So I don't know if it's, tell me if I'm right into asking that to you, but if I am a solopreneur, so I am the only person in the company and I am the one executing the work and the company brings in since five years, the company brings in $300,000. Sure. Does that mean if the consultant divorce and we are supposed to uh, divide the assets, let's say in half, does that person, so the, the other spouse has a right to half of the earnings or half of the, uh, how do we call it, half of the profit of that company? It's an excellent question. This comes up all the time with similar businesses. So when we represent consultants, I've represented consultants working for some of the major global players in that in the field. And it comes up with attorneys, accountants, of even you know medical professionals, because the business is somewhat similar. There's a stream of revenue based on the professional's efforts but not a lot of hard assets. There, there yeah. may not even, you know, if it's a law firm, it's a, some desks and some computers. Generally it's accounts receivable and the person's brain, or maybe yeah. a few people working in a team and some money in a bank account. So what you see in that instance is, and in fact, that in the book, we talk about business valuations and how that's done in chapter 12 of the book, how those businesses Excellent. are valued is dealt with in detail. But when you have a business like that, it's really just a stream of income. And if the person isn't involved in the business, there is no business. So essentially, there is really no business to value when it's a solopreneur or a consultant. It's really just a stream of income. And in that instance, the court is really looking at it from a child support and and maintenance or alimony standpoint. So yes, you might share some of that income under the child support laws or the alimony law of your particular jurisdiction, but they're really, the business is essentially a zero for valuation purposes because there is no, there are no real hard assets other than accounts receivable, like I said, and maybe some money in the bank. The, the worst thing you could, that might happen is if there's an excess amount of cash in the company's bank account, court might think, well, they haven't pulled out enough of, in compensation and they don't need to leave a lot in the company to operate. So they might deem that some of those funds or all of them should be marital property and those dollars divided if there's money in a bank account. But the average solopreneur, the the typical solopreneur, the typical consultant, generally speaking, doesn't need to worry about having to come up with a value for half of their business and and sort of give that to the other person. It's just not going to work like that. The typical professional business like that, like a law firm, CPA or lawyer, CPA, that kind of thing. Usually the company has a zero asset value, but there's a value for the income stream. Okay. Uh, Is it also based on the value of income stream for, let's say like a law firm, but the co-founder, a co-owner of a law firm who has, I don't know, 30% of the shares of the company, it would also be a revenue based. Like, yeah, like you're, you're really looking at, yeah. right. You're really looking at the revenue earned by the person over time, almost like it's really from the compensation analysis because these businesses are so highly personal the the main thing to look at is personal goodwill. The business is dependent entirely on the personal goodwill of the people involved. And the minute that the entrepreneur or the consultant leaves the business, there is no company, there is no business. So when, as opposed to a McDonald's, let's say like a fast food restaurant where it's all enterprise goodwill, you know, that it doesn't matter who the manager is of the local McDonald's, it's worth two million or three million dollars just because it's a McDonald's. Not you don't care who the manager is when you're buying hamburgers there. You just care that it's a McDonald's. The flip side of that is in our businesses, yours, mine, in the consultants world, people care a hundred percent who the person is. <laughs> it's you know they're, they're, the brand name is you. So exactly. It's exactly. so really the typical. I'd say the viewer of this podcast is an individual business person you know, selling their skills, their mind, their brain doesn't have much to fear in terms of what their business is worth. It's really just an income analysis and it will come into, take into account for child support alimony. Okay. In the recent uh, past, there has been uh, two kind of uh, very high profile uh, divorce cases, uh, at least to my knowledge. There was, of course, uh, Jeff Bezos 
and more recently uh, it's more an artist i don't know if you know him but the dr dre yes uh, <laughs> what, what you were talking about the uh, you know the i think it was the prenuptial agreement was maybe not totally validated etc so I, i'm not asking you in detail exactly what happened i don't know if you if you have uh, followed those cases but what do they maybe uh, kind of inspire you uh, as examples like okay jeff bezos is a unicorn is the the richest i think the richest man in the world so okay it's a right. unicorn but uh, right it's, well uh, yeah. the one thing that you find about the rich and famous is you don't hear very much about their divorces so bill gates jeff bezos dr dre you only hear when things go wrong like dre's case with respect to bezos and gates there have been some stories here and there but we don't really know any details the smart move by jeff bezos and his wife was They did everything privately. They kept everything out of the public eye. They avoided court. They negotiated everything like a business deal and they got it done out of the public eye, largely out of the public eye. There have been some stories leaked to the press, but really considering the size of his huge estate <laughs> and the importance he has worldwide and his worldwide fame, it's really kind of incredible how little is out there about his divorce. And that's all by design. The rich and famous get divorced privately and quietly. And that's all planned out in advance. And everyday people should do that too. And that's the kind of thing I advocate in my book. There's no reason to fight a war. It should be handled in more of a business-like transaction. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And then uh, maybe talking about, uh, we are uh, reaching kind of the end of our conversation, but you mentioned uh, something about the title of chapter 12, but can you maybe tell the audience a little bit, of, a little bit more about what type of content they can uh, read in the book? Absolutely. So in the book, we talk about divorce myths. So things that people believe about the court or believe about divorce that are untrue. We talk about the four costs of divorce. So try to make it clear to people, there's more than just attorney's fees that are costs of divorce. And it, I stress the importance of a cost benefit analysis when analyzing any options in a divorce case. First of all, understanding your chances of success in any given strategy, understanding the cost it takes to get there, And what is your realistic range of outcomes? And when you understand that, just like any other business decision you would make, if you understand the risks and the potential rewards, then you can make a business decision about which route to take, whether you should go to trial, settle the case, what the settlement should be, you know, what the terms should be. So if you take that business-like approach to a divorce and try to take emotion out of it as much as possible, you're going to get the best results. That too many people fall down a spiral of getting angry and upset and it's understandable and they they fail to use their business person brain and they use their animal brain to make decisions and it just costs them a tremendous amount of money and grief in the end to no real benefit to themselves true, or their true, families true okay so great so things like the, the cost and the myth about divorce this is absolutely a great content and by the way i also tell a story each chapter tells a story from a real case about a client mm -hmm. who went through a difficult time and then it discusses the advice that i would give in those those circumstances and then how that advice helped them in their case. So there are you know, 18 different client stories or more in the case wow. from real cases. And I even reproduce a letter from a settlement letter from a real case and the strategy I used to settle a case that really was a nightmare for the client. So a lot of good content in there for people to use. And it's easy to find what is relevant to your situation, no matter what stage you are in the case with a table of contents in the organization. It's very easy to find what applies to you. And I think people can find some value in many different parts of the book. You don't have to read it beginning to end to find value. Yeah. Also, I think one thing I wanted to add is that you practice what you preach because you have, as you said, you have been yourself, you're yourself a divorced person and you, and I think you managed to do it uh, amicably, if I can say it like that. Huh? We did. We were yeah. divorced in, well, really the actual case itself was probably six to eight weeks, but from wow. us discussing things and having counseling to being done, was a few months at most. And we worked it out at the kitchen table. And I attribute a lot of that to my, my ex-wife, very practical person, very brilliant person and hardworking. And we both understood the assets and liabilities and income and expenses. We opened up our computers, talked through everything, and we were good at communicating with each other. So we avoided going down the spiral of recriminations and being angry and And having that drag us down into, you know, mudslinging and, and a spiral. So I, I call it the divorce swamp. But she and I knew that none of that was good for us or our children. So 
we took a very practical approach and also with my experience as a divorce lawyer, and she knew from my war stories that it was something to be avoided. So she got a lawyer and uh, I had some folks in my law firm check over everything we were doing and, and we got it done very efficiently and at very little cost. And that's kind of the secret divorce lawyers know is our kind of an inside joke is if everybody did it this way, we'd be out of business. Well, <laughs> that's, that's the kind of advice I want to share with people. So, I, you know, that's what's in the book is telling people secrets or things that divorce lawyers generally don't say, not because they want to keep things secret, but it's just not something that's commonly talked about. And, sure, and people yeah. go down conventional routes all the time. They just go to court and proceed. And then eventually they, 95% of divorce cases settle in the United States, meaning, meaning they don't go to trial. Well, my goal is to get people to settle those cases sooner. That, mm-hmm. That's okay. You know, we don't need to do the work. We'll work on someone else's case. So yeah. that's that's my advice to anyone, whether they hired us or, or anyone else is thinking about it in a business-like manner, trying to take emotion out of it and use as much common sense as possible to try to be done as efficiently as possible. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. Yes, it could be a way to put yourself out of business. That's uh, the ironic thing. And, <laughs> and uh, cool. yeah, it's funny that you say you had the discussion at the kitchen table because I would say eh, maybe the kitchen would be the last uh, <laughs> room where I had to go and thinking with all the utensils. <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> I funny. guess so. Yeah, yeah. Well, we weren't worried about anything like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> oh, no, well, that's great. That's a great, great example. Otherwise, do you have anything else or anything uh, special to share to the audience with regards to the book? Well, I'd like to, I, I'm going to offer a discount code for your, your audience for books on Gumroad. So we sell our ebook is on Kindle, Amazon, uh, also paperback and, you know, hardcover, but on Gumroad, you can get the PDF and I'll offer a discount code for one third off the, the price to your audience. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm happy to do that. Delighted to be on your show. It's a real privilege. I really appreciate it, Diogen. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I, I do want to answer, you always ask about the, uh, the, the what's consul- the consulting lifestyle? Yes, 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 yes. I wanted to ask that. Yes. Uh, okay, what great. does having a consulting lifestyle mean to you as a divorce lawyer? Yes. What the consulting lifestyle means to me is the ability to control my own destiny as a consultant and, and be able to be my own boss, but to provide guidance to people for their really most important issues in their lives with respect to their business. And of course, for me, legal issues with divorce, but being a consultant means being held in a very high position of trust. And it's a real privilege to be a consultant for people. That's what I hoped for when I became a lawyer. I wanted to be trusted by people for them to seek me out for advice on such serious weighty matters. And your viewers, I'm sure they feel the same way that it's a real privilege to be a consultant and to be trusted with that, you know, position to give people advice like that. Excellent. Excellent. If there is anyone who wants to get in touch with you, so there is, of course, the link with the discount code on the book, but if anyone wants to get in touch with you, where can they find you? Yeah. So I'm easy to find. You can just Google my name, Rayford Palmer, or I just want this done.com the title of the book. We have a website for the book. That's easy to reach. There's an email, there's a contact form there, an email address. I am on the internet everywhere at Rayford Palmer, R-A-I-F-O-R-D-P-A-L-M-E-R. Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok. <laughs> I'm very easy to find. Excellent. Excellent. So we will put all of that in the show notes. Rayford, that was an amazing interview. I think very, very key information uh, for the older listeners uh, out here. So thanks very much. And I wish you the best with the book and also with your career. Mm-hmm.